Um, hello again. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you so much for coming to our panel discussion, uh, which is entitled The Ghost of Tom Joad, uh, The Relevancy of Grapes of Wrath. Um, anytime you can get a Bruce Springsteen lyric uh, into a panel discussion title, I think we should opt for that. Um, <laughs> So, so thank you so much for coming. Uh, we have a very esteemed panel here. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the historical context of uh, the Great Depression and uh, Grapes of Wrath. Um, but then we're also going to talk about how um, relevant this show is uh, to today. Uh, how many of you have seen uh, our production of Grapes of Wrath? Oh, so good. Give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> How many people are like, I thought this was Evita, I thought I was at PPAC. <laughs> um, uh, now I lost uh, But um, so since you have seen the show, uh, you obviously know it wasn't necessarily set in a in a realistic setting. It's obviously set in a bar with a bar <laughs> band over here. Um, and part of the reasoning behind that was that Brian McLean, the director of the production, wanted to kind of set it outside of this realistic setting so that um, we wouldn't look at it as rooted in one particular time, rooted in you know the 1930s, but to see it as a little bit more timeless so that we could draw the connections that are, are present in the play um, and in the, the, the novel, The Grapes of Wrath. Um, and uh, so this, is, this panel is kind of an extension, extension of that. Um, now I'm going to be quiet because I am not as smart as everyone else on this panel. Uh, uh, would you mind just introducing yourself and telling a, a little bit about where you come from and just a little bit about yourselves? Um, first of all, um, Lucas and I teach at Brown, but if we enjoyed the play we went the other day on Wednesday. It was such a fabulous to see a lot of the cast members here. It's like, oh, we see the stars here. <laughs> we really, really enjoyed it, so thank you very much. Um, so my name is Naoko Shibasawa, and I teach at Brown. I was hired as the diplomatic historian at, at Brown, but I kind of changed it, so I really am interested in, in issues of empire. And so what I'm going to be talking about is like the global Great Depression. Could you speak up? The global Great Depression and the origins of, of World War II. Uh, sure, so thanks. Uh, my name is Lucas Rappel. Uh, I, together with Naoko, I also teach at Brown. Um, I just started working there this year. It's my first year, actually. Um, and I teach uh, sort of courses at the intersection of uh, the history of science, especially history of biology, and the history of uh, American capitalism. So kind of American economic history in especially the kind of 19th and early 20th century. <coughs> And I'm Eric Hirsch. I teach over at Providence College in the sociology department. And I do a lot of work on homelessness, both advocacy of the <coughs> Coalition for the Homeless and uh, research on that as well. And I think I'm here probably primarily to talk about that. <laughs> but I may say a few things about the depression yeah. as well. <laughs> <coughs> and I'm Richard Godfrey. And I'm not a professor, uh, but I'm sort of uh, boots on the ground in terms of what's been happening over the past five years, uh, but also leading up to uh, this foreclosure crisis. And uh, our agency, I'm the executive director of Rhode Island Housing, and we sort of saw the crisis coming. In fact, in about 2005, we were running a program called Don't Borrow Trouble. Um, a lot of people didn't listen to us. Um, but we have been one of the primary agencies administering uh, stimulus programs in the state of Rhode Island, dealing with foreclosure prevention, doing a lot of homeowner counseling. So we've really sort of seen uh, what's happening here and across the country. Uh, mm -hmm. Over the past uh, years, I, I have been the president of the National Council of State Housing Finance Agencies and sort of got a perspective on what was happening. And in fact, um, in talking to some of my uh, peers across the country, I got a response from the executive director of the Oklahoma HFA, and he sort of gave me his response, or his perspective, of the Oklahoman's perspective on Grapes of Wrath, too, so uh, it's interesting. Yeah. He wasn't, he didn't, he doesn't necessarily like the Grapes of Wrath. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I should also point out, Eric, Eric is, um, I believe, the, on the board of the Rhode Island Coalition for the Homeless. Uh, and on October 11th, um, we recently extended Grapes of Wrath because it's been such a success. 
Uh, and so on Friday, October 11th, we're actually having a benefit show where the proceeds of that will go to the Rhode Island Coalition for the Homeless, as well as DARE, which I have written down, is the Direct Action for Rights and Equality. Um, so all the, benefit, all the proceeds for that show will go to those uh, two organizations. Um, so if you want to see it again, that is a great night to come. Uh, and, um, and also, Eric, thanks for, for being here. Oh, yeah, and thank you for doing that. We appreciate that. Yeah. Um, and that was also something that our, our yeah. I, 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 I would be remiss to say uh, that that actually, that impetus came from um, our acting company. Uh, we've obviously talked to a lot of people that have been very personally affected by the show. And uh, so that really came together. And Charlie was one of the spearheaded, Char hi Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and Charlie certainly to helped kind of spearhead that. So. Um, one of the added bonuses of having a resident company is that they care about what's happening around your community. Um, and uh, Charlie and Becky and Mia, who are all here, are all new company members. Uh, so we're happy to have you guys. So thank you. Um, where do I begin? Great Depression. So I'm going to start a little bit more with the history side of things. Um, so, uh, Lucas, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll start with you just a little bit. Can you just give us a little bit of context for the, for the Great Depression? But then you also wanted to talk about some of the environmental factors as well, right? Yeah, sure. Um, so one thing I wanted to talk about was, uh, so um, I went with Nalco to watch the play uh, just last week, which I really enjoyed a great deal. And I was really struck um, by this really powerful scene at the beginning of the play uh, where it's uh, Tom Jones, uh, Tom Joad, and the preacher and uh, they're caught up in this dust storm when they're sort of when Tom Joad is coming back to the farm. <clears throat> and it's this kind of um, cataclysmic event that sort of seems to, seems to kind of rain down upon them as if out of nowhere. Uh, but one thing that's really interesting about um, the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl that happens in the, um, in the sort of central plains of the United States during the 1930s is that they're actually not, <clears throat> they're not really freak occurrences. They're both, they have a kind of common root cause uh, and they're both sort of um, linked to one another uh, in the kind of economic development of the United States, uh, which had been taking place going back to the sort of second half of the 19th century, where the United States economy was really rooted um, in a kind of in, a, in these um, extractive practices. Uh, so both the kind of industrial economy, which was centered in the Northeast, but especially the agricultural economy, uh, which was centered in the Great Plains area. So as the uh, as the nation industrialized and the railroads uh, kind of expanded westward uh, from the industrial center across the United States all the way to California, it opened up all these new areas to settlement and economic exploitation. And in fact, the federal government very strongly sort of encouraged, uh, financially encouraged people to move west through new uh, laws like the Homestead Act, basically serving as a kind of uh, federal real estate agent for the whole country, uh, encouraging people to move west, move into the Great Plains area where the Dust Bowl eventually happened, uh, by get, basically giving away land uh, or, or selling it at very, very cheap prices to people who, quote unquote, sort of improved the land, which meant that you would cultivate the land, you would irrigate the land. What's interesting is that <clears throat> this is land that was um, initially considered unsuitable for farming. And the reason for that is that the Great Plains are uh, a sort of semi-arid, almost desert-like region. So I'm talking about the area of Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, where the Dust Bowl happened. Um, it's fairly high elevation, not a lot of rainfall, uh, but what, uh, what some of these new industrial technologies allowed people to do was uh, uh, to irrigate these areas, right, uh, and to also cultivate much larger tracts of land. So you didn't have to have such dense agricultural settlements uh, because you could cultivate very large tracts of land using new industrial technologies like the tractor that were just being developed in order to feed these large cities that are growing up in the industrial north northeast, uh, you know, Philadelphia, uh, uh, New York, but also Chicago and other places. <clears throat> well, anyway, as this happened, uh, what people do, of course, right, so this is an extractive economy, so what people do is they turn the land, in a kind of literal sense, turn the land into money by taking value out of the land, whether you're mining in the, in the far west or, or practicing agriculture in the Great Plains, <clears throat> but in order to make the land valuable, in order to make it productive, you have to disturb the kind of resident or, or indigenous ecosystem, which in the Great Plains were these tall prairie, prairie grasses, tall, tall prairie grasses which were not considered kind of productive, right? Those were replaced by wheat or corn or cattle or things like that. 
<clears throat> well, as the pr what people didn't realize was that the prairie grasses uh, were serving a kind of ecological purpose in this area, which is that they had this really deep root system. Right? This is an area that doesn't get a lot of rain. So what the deep roots do is they allow it's a, a, a you know evolutionary adaptation to this arid region. What the deep roots allow the prairie grasses to do is to suck up moisture from deep off, deep down into the land. But it also prevents erosion, right? So once people start uh, plowing the soil with these new technologies, new tractors, plowing ever deeper and deeper to get at the more elusive um, uh, sort of fertile soil, they're digging up these root systems, right? They're disturbing these ecologies. So when the Great Depression hits, which, which happens as a, as a result of this industrial economy sort of overheating, especially speculation in land, that bubble finally bursts in the late 1920s, the Depression hits. Now, right coincident with that, is a drought that happens. And this is not uh, an unpredictable thing that happens. This region goes through droughts uh, seriotic, periodically, sort of cyclically. But normally when there's a drought, it's not an ecological disaster because you have this root system from the prairie grasses. But because of this extractive economy, because of this kind of rise in industrial capitalism in the United States, uh, that root system's been disturbed. And that's what causes those dust storms that then displaces people, of course, right? That's what forces people like the Joes to move off the land and to seek their fortunes elsewhere. Um, and I'll, I'll, I have some things to say about parallels too. I, I'll leave it at that, but there's some very interesting parallels, obviously, to what's happened as, you know, capitalism hasn't stopped, it's only heated up more. What's happening in the present day, where some of these kinds of um, um, destructive ecological uh, consequences are happening on a global <coughs> scale with climate change and things like that. Yeah, well, we can, <coughs> listen, Lucas, let's dive in, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, well, because, yeah, let's dive into it. I mean, I, I immediately thought of Hurricane Sandy when you were thinking of that, where you have yeah. the people that, been displaced, you know, their homes had been wrecked, and, um, and I think a lot of them are, are still homes. You know, I just read an article the other day that, that said people had to move out of the FEMA trailers or wherever they were. Um, but yeah, no, please go ahead and talk about that. That's fine. Well, so one uh, kind of important common thread that runs throughout um, that long history of capitalism, right, going back to the 19th century, is this notion that to make land productive, it has to be commodified in a way. <coughs> And that, that's a very particular way of valuing something, right? When you, when you commodify something, what you're doing is you're assigning it a value in a very particular context, which is a free market context, right? The value of that land is what you can get from the land, either extracting from it or from you know, selling the land itself on an open market. But that, of course, um, um, sort of blinds you to all sorts of other values that, that, that uh, a land or a practice or a person or whatever it is that you're talking about might have. And in this case, for example, in the Dust Bowl, of course, it's it's uh, kind of ecological value that these, let's say these prairie grasses have. <laughs> but modern and you know economists call these these values that can't be measured in a free market. These are externalities, right? Values that that the market can't capture. It's a form of market failure. Um, so one thing that um, uh, that you know capitalist economies are never good at is capturing these external values. These values that aren't sort of folded into the commodity value of things. <clears throat> and global warming. Global climate change is exactly a, a result of that, right? The reason we can't, as a as a, as a world global society, the reason we can't get a handle on <coughs> climate change is precisely because uh, of all the enormous economic costs, right, that are associated with uh, uh, moving away from using fossil fuels, uh, developing more efficient uh, uh, ways of living, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, have huge economic costs. But of course, the opposite of do like not doing anything has, of course, even bigger economic costs. The problem is those economic costs aren't measured in the kind of standard models uh, that free market economists use because those are those kinds of external costs, right? The, the costs that aren't folded into uh, the value of these commodities. <clears throat> and, uh, but once, you know, once the system kind of <laughs> keeps, keeps rolling on, those, those values, those externalities become more and more apparent. So with global climate change, uh, so in the Dust Bowl you saw it, right, with people migrating out of the Great Plains into places like California. With climate change, of course, we're already seeing it as well people migrating out of especially Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, into Europe, where just like the Jodes, uh, you know, they sort of expect uh, economic prosperity as a result of their movement, uh, but of course what they need is exactly the opposite, right? They're not welcome in the places they arrive, because they're seen to be disruptive to the kind of uh, economy that's already existing in those places, right? They're seen to lower wages, they're seen to take jobs away from people, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, <clears throat> so the economy, it's kind of this, uh, instability that's built into global capitalism from the very foundation of it, right, from the process of commodification, that it can't sort of um, accurately assess or capture the full value of the things that are being, that are circulating through the economy, and that sort of creates market failures, or creates instabilities within the economy itself, that then in some, con in some cases lead to global economic consequences, which of course have, have huge social implications. Yeah. 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 Let me just jump in. Yeah, please. No, no, I'll I'll just, ask talking you. about, you know, the 
commodification. Um, one of the huge causes of the, of the Great Recession was the commodification of home mortgages. Um, and you separated the value of that loan from the property itself. And it became a virtual financial transaction as opposed to being tied directly to a house. And the more that was globalized, and so you had investors from the Middle East and from China investing in this um, virtual investment in land. Right. It, it really shift, would cause a shift from the local banking relationship between the homeowner and someone in the community. Mm -hmm. And that created a whole series of problems right. that eventually imploded. Right. Iceland actually went bankrupt because they invested in those bundled securities of subprime mortgages. <coughs> and that's really that really went global at that point. Um, Can I sort of jump yeah, in? Yeah, of course, so I kind of want to bring it back to Lucas's point about the environment, because I had just read, maybe some of you guys had read this too, that um, Syria, before like it got involved in the Arab Spring, had suffered a huge drought between 2006 and 2011. You know, experienced one of the worst droughts in modern history, right? And so we had to, so I, you know, I say, you know, um, international relations, so I'm going to bring it to war, to talk about war, and how that the, the condition of what happened in Syria actually added to the instability that caused this sort of civil war. Mm -hmm. And so we have to think in terms of what these sort of natural disasters are doing and putting pressures on populations, causing instability, and then causing hostilities. And so to put that to that <coughs> perspective too. So um, I had read here that also Can that you speak up I had also, sorry, I had a cold, so I'm kind of <laughs> yeah. like talking through my lectures and stuff like that. Um, that um, there was a fault in the mismanagement of natural resources, and the Bashar Assad had been subsidizing water intensive crops like wheat and cotton, of course, for export, right? And so mm. I'm kind of wondering if there's some sort of parallel with some sort of indigenous, probably grasses or what have you, of that, you know, would be ruined in the process that made this, you know, conflict, I mean, you know, that made this sort of, you know, drought even worse, and of course, you know, added to the place of people and all that sort of stuff, too. Um, that, you know, there's like 1.5 million people in Syria had been, within Syria had been displaced for this, and they were going to population centers that were already being populated by Iraqi refugees, thanks to us, right? And also to Palestinian uh, um, refugees as well. And so what I also want to think about when we talk about the Great Depression is not only to think about you know, what's happening in terms of the economy per se, but also to think about the other part of what's in the news today, not just the recession, but war and the militarization of our society, because that's where you can date it to. You can date it to the Depression era, right? So I kind of want to go back a little bit and say that in the, the post-World War I era, right, so how to make peace afterwards, it was basically it rested on American dollars. So as maybe many of you guys know, that Germany <coughs> was slapped with this huge reparations bill that they could not pay. And, but they needed, but the Europeans needed to have that, the Allies needed to have that, because they had loans to pay back to the Americans. And of course, the Americans wanted to have those loans to pay back. So how did this happen? So then the Americans lent money to the Germans so that the Germans could pay back the Europeans <laughs> so that the Europeans could pay back the Americans, right? So, and then this worked fine until the dollar collapsed, right? And with the dollar collapse, it's sort of kind of, kind of like a system of treaty, you know, arrangements kind of fell apart. Another part to that also is that it was also using the kind of carrot um, and, um, with the Japanese. So they were trying to encourage the Japanese from not going, for, from, for um, accepting open door and allowing Americans to trade in, in, in China um, in exchange for bank loans from New York bankers, right? So, but once those bank loans started to uh, stop coming, right? then the Japanese didn't feel the sort of necessity anymore to sort of like, you know, stick to open door. I don't know if any, most of you guys know this, because I think the way that World War II is taught, or at least the way I was taught back in the 20th century, is that <laughs> the Japanese were crazy, they bombed Pearl Harbor, and that's the end of the story, right? That, this is the Japs are crazy, they bombed, it. it's not like, well known, that it is, but the, the main sort of reason why the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, why they went to war with America, is that they were fighting over China. Right, who gets to control China, right? Mm. And with the Great Depression, you have the sense that um, that you cannot rely on multilateral relationships anymore, and that Japan mm. felt like it needed to create an autarky, an autarky meaning a self-sufficient empire. Well, what did they need for their self? Because they couldn't rely on you know. So what did they need for their self-sufficient empire? Well, they needed Manchuria. They needed China. 
And that's sort of the origins of that war. And so we have to sort of keep that in mind as well, too. So anyways, so the, you know, the World War II. So, uh, well, actually, before I get to World War II, let's go back a little bit. So what were the responses? What, okay, so, J so Japan, I just told you, went to autarky, right? Which is actually, you can make the argument that this is what Japan, the Germany, you know, did as well, a little bit. And Italy did as well, too. Like, you know, um, taking part of these sort of settler colonial sort of projects in a way and trying to spread their territory. Right? They kind of embrace colonialism in a sense too, right? Um, you had welfare capitalism in places like Canada, Britain, and France. You know, when you have the government trying to step in and mitigate the very worst of what's happening, trying to take care of people, what have you, um, to some degree like the New Deal, right? This is why, you know, it's so hated by so many people. It's because it was a form of welfare, right? Um, other places there were like, oops, my, my thing went off. Uh, military dictatorship in places like, um, so, uh, you know, Argentina, Central America, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in the Soviet Union, there was totalitarian collectivization, you know, five-year plans to try to push the peasants off their farms, make them more efficient, produce more food, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, the peasants didn't want to lose their land, and so they had to be sent off to, I can't believe I said they had to be, but they were sent off to Siberia, and this is like the Great Purges, in which maybe 20,000, 20 million people were killed in the Soviet Union, right? And so and then what do we have as a result of the United States? We had the New Deal, which worked for a while, but, but you know, FDR himself was never really comfortable with deficit spending either, you know? He was not that comfortable with it. And so as soon as the U.S. economy seemed to be doing very well, um, he pulled back a little bit, and that was, that's what caused the 1937 recession, right? So what really cured the Great Depression, as most of us know, is World War II, mm -hmm. right? World War II. So basically what happened in World War II is that we embraced military Keynesism. So we just started to sort of pay for war. We became a war sort of, you know, buying, producing, you know, country actually. And our economy, our political economy, is, is still based on this war economy. In a sense, this is what Germany had tried a little bit earlier. When we, it's come to say, oh, you know, response to the Great Depression was that Germany became militaristic, right? Whatever, you know, whatever you want to, however you want to define that, by putting a lot of resources into this military. But that's precisely what the United States ended up doing to cure the Great Depression, in a sense. And we're still in that sort of, you know, what we would call the military industrial complex as a result of this. And so you still see the results of it still today, you know, it's, it's ongoing. And so we're talking about the, the Great Depression, but to understand also this is where we see this of the rise of our militarized society today. You know, I was a history major in college, and I just learned so much, right, just listening to you talk about like, I, I took like three courses right in yeah. my life. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Um, um, Eric, do you want to talk just a little bit, I mean, because what's unique about, and, I, and also we're going to have a Q&A &A after, just so you know, so. Um, but Eric, you're, you're, you have a very unique perspective in the sense that you do a lot of work um, for the homeless, but you're also a historian yourself. Um, you know, I'd be curious to know what your response is to the to the grapes of wrath, and and how you kind of um, what sort of parallels do you see, especially as a historian? Yeah, well, let me just talk a little bit about the depression and the Great Recession. So we have the Great Depression and the Great Recession, and I think there are a lot of parallels between the two. And I think a lot of the impacts have been similar in terms of people winding up homeless. I think in both cases you had speculation, like Lucas was saying, and it was unregulated speculation. So no one was really telling these speculators what they could do. And I think in the case of the Great Depression, people were buying stocks and bonds on margin. That was like 10%. So they were building up a house of cards that really wasn't going to be able to stand. And then, just like the Great Recession, once you pull out one of the cards, the entire stack falls down because everyone owes a ton of money to everyone else. So that unregulated speculation is something that's common. And you know, another thing that's, I think, important to recognize is that exactly at the dawn of the Great Depression and the dawn of the Great Recession, you had the highest percentage of income going to the top 1% in American history. It was about a quarter of all income was going to the top 
So not only did you have this problem of speculation, but you have the problem of underconsumption. You know, if you're funneling all of your income to people at the top of the system, you're not going to have the demand to clear the products that you're producing. And I would say that's exactly why we're in a recovery that's sluggish. It's because we are almost all of the recovery is for people at the top, the top 1%. Almost none of the recovery is for people farther down in the class system. So we're having a problem in terms of adequate demand to get the economy going again. So, so go ahead. I just wish someone to add one thing. We say 1%, but we're really not talking about the 1%. We're talking about like the 0.1%. <laughs> <laughs> right? When we say 1%, that includes more people than actually yes, the competent true. going to. It's really like a 0.01%. Absolutely. Yes, the higher you go, yeah. the more it's concentrated. Absolutely. Yeah. So, the inequality in itself generates homelessness. And here's a way that it generates it that most people don't think of. You think, oh, it's because there are poor people who can't afford apartments. But it also distorts the housing production. So it's mainly producing housing for people at the top of the system. And Richard can, can tell me, I'm sure, we don't even produce middle income housing anymore without a government subsidy. In fact, we count low and moderate income housing by counting the, subs the government subsidized units in the state. And it's, it's all, what is it, 36,000, something like that. So yeah. what you do when you have that kind of inequality on the wealth and income at the top is you distort the housing production system. And poor people tend to live in housing that used to be for middle class people but it's gotten older. If you stop producing it, a generation later, two generations later, there's nothing for poor people to live in. The stock of housing for them is smaller and smaller. The price gets bid up and you have higher and higher rents, even for people at the bottom of the system. And that's what generates homelessness. The fact that the rents are too high for people to afford. So the latest, this is Richard's data from Rhode Island Housing. The average two-bedroom apartment that's available goes for $1,176 a month in Rhode Island. To afford that, you need forty-seven, forty-eight thousand dollars $48,000 a year in income. That's just about half of the entire set of households, that's 200,000 households in Rhode Island, can't afford that apartment. So essentially you have market failure, the failure of the market to deliver housing to a near majority of your people. That's what generates homelessness. I mean, the main reasons, there were 5,000 homeless people last year in Rhode Island the main reasons they said were they couldn't afford the rents, they didn't have a job, they're all economic reasons. You know, people think, oh well, these people are alcoholics and drug users and so on. <coughs> we tend to think of them as other, right? Like they're the exactly. other, they are something but no, other than me. 1,300 of them were children, so I don't think their drug use was necessarily very high or you know, all the other things you might think with regard to homeless people. 1,300 kids whose mainly mothers could not afford those apartments. So, you know, we have, I'd say, nationally, at any given moment, about 700,000 people are homeless. I also count people are doubled up, so people who don't have the money, you know, to get their own place, and they're forced to live with <coughs> friends or family because of that economic reason. About seven and a half million people are doubled up in the United States. We've got 5,000 homeless people in Rhode Island and about 17, 18,000 people doubled up. So, you know, it's probably somewhat less in the depression. We don't really have good numbers on that, but you're probably looking at one and a half to two million homeless people at any given point, and maybe six or seven million total over the course of a year in the middle of the Great Depression. Uh, in terms of, you know, we sort of don't have any idea of how many people were doubled up. I think one, one of the things about the Depression is more people were on the move. So there were more people like the Okies, you know, moving 
to try to find a better situation. You had tons of people riding the railroads. That's where the word hobo came from. Right. And you know, so transients were much more common then. Now people tend to stay. Most of the people who are homeless in Rhode Island are Rhode Islanders. You know, they were born here or have lived here for a long time. The bonus marchers, absolutely. Trying to get a little more money to be able to afford housing and the other things they needed to live. Richard, I'd love to hear you respond to some of that. So there are, um, there are so many things to, to respond to. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I did want to highlight you know, one thing that Eric pointed out was that you know, we have this image of homelessness, which would be the, sort of the chronic homeless. You know, they, they would have been the hobos or the, or the Okies before. Today, we see them as the drug addicts or the street people. But that really is a very small percentage of the homeless in Rhode Island and in America. You know, it probably, um, there were less than 1,000 people who are chronically homeless folks with uh, multiple episodes of homelessness caused by some external factor, whereas um, the other 4,000 or so are really a result of the fact that they can't afford a place to live. And we have this huge deficit of homes that are available. Um, also, sort of pre-2005, um, we saw mobility fostered by um, cheaper places to live. People would move to a cheaper place to live. And whereas during the Depression, people moved after the fact, in the Great Recession, people were angry because they were so much in debt, they couldn't um, move someplace else. And, and I think you know, one of the... Um, the lines in the, in the Grapes of Wrath talks about the bank, the bank, you know, and, you know, the, the banks are fulfilling the same role today that they did back then. They are the invisible bad guys. Um, and, but what we've done is we've sort of uh, glorified credit scores, um, and so that not only hinders your access to credit, but also your access to jobs, um, because everyone does a background check, and so you're really, if you've failed economically, you were really blacklisted in, in many different regards. But people are, you know, we haven't seen the mobility that we had sort of pre-2005. Pre um, but one of the issues that the, the Northeast faces, and Eric again talked about our aged housing style here in Rhode Island, which is um, of not good quality, but very expensive. Whereas you could move to places like South Carolina, North Carolina, where, um, or um, Nevada, where they were building lots of new stuff cheap. Um, and um, people moved to the sand states, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, um, sort of because of this perpetual cycle, this, or this Ponzi scheme of new construction, therefore people were working in the construction industry, and therefore they would buy new homes. And once that stopped, it, it collapsed unto itself. And I don't think you know, we, we ever referred to um, the Southwest as the sand states until you know, they were really the hardest hit by uh, this recession. Um, another interesting parallel is you know, during the Great Depression, California was the land of opportunity. During the Great Recession, they were sort of ground zero in terms of one of the hardest hit states in terms of unemployment and loss of property value. So there were uh, lots of different threads moving through here. Also in the responses, uh, you know, during the Great Recession, we saw the creation of Fannie Mae and FDIC um, and many other elements to sort of create a banking system that would respond uh, and prevent a new one from occurring. What we're looking at now is there still no is there is no long-term financial system. We're talking about dismantling uh, Fannie Mae, um, and decreasing the role of FHA at a time when the country really needs it the most, certainly those folks who have been damaged by the credit crunch now have no access. And you know, they, um, one of the things the banking industry likes to talk about is skin in the game. Um, and you know, people, the, the system collapsed because people didn't have enough equity in their homes. Well. Uh, first of all, I find that offensive because I think no one has more skin in the game than someone who is desperate to hold on to their home. You know, they have no place else to go. 
Um, they can't afford an apartment, so therefore they'll do everything they can to hang on to that house. And then the facts themselves just don't uh, prove that out. You know, we, um, our agency makes loans to, pe to more people of color with less equity, more urban, and our uh, foreclosure rate is one seventh that of the private sector mortgage banking industry. So, um, say that again, please. One seventh. One seventh. Yes. Um, it's not about um, equity in the home. It's about what it means to you. Uh, yeah, please. Thing. So, <clears throat> one thing that occurred to me about the grapes of wrath is the labels that are put on people. So the label of being an Okie, the idea that you are somehow responsible for, as we've all said, is actually you know, things that are caused by much broader structural forces in the economy and the political system. But as long as we think the Okie is responsible, or as long as we think the homeless person is responsible, we're never going to solve this. You know, until people understand that it's a failure of the market in all of these cases. You know, I think people are starting to get the idea that maybe the speculators had something to do with it, right? You but know, also it was a failure of government. Um, the lack of regulation. Yeah. In 2005, Fannie Mae, which was the primary funder of all mortgages, was automatically approving you if you had a high credit score and you could pay up to 60% of your income towards your mortgage. 60%, uh, that was an automatic approval. So you had families whose really their only uh, way their credit score was determined <coughs> was based on the fact that they were paying rent on time and were paying their uh, utility bills on time. If you did that, um, you had a pretty good credit score. Therefore, you know, let's say your rent was $900 a month. You could have been automatically approved for a mortgage of $1,800 a month, um, and that was automatic. Um, and no one was watching the store and saying this is outrageous and it was well and some of the subprime mortgages were far worse than that i mean literally the people without jobs getting approved yes um absolutely yeah so and no one was regulating that either right and can i mean i'd, I'd be curious taking it back just a little bit looking at some of the policy implications that were put into effect during the great depression to help uh, fix that crisis. And as, and as you said, FDR kind of pulled back a little bit in around 37, which is actually when the Great Depression takes place, right? It's not necessarily 1929, which is when we think of the Great Depression, but it was rather a little bit later on. Um, so you had a lot of, uh, some policy uh, uh, initiatives that were put into place to help ward that off. And I'm curious, and anyone can really answer this one, as to exactly what happened so that we now came into the Great Recession, obviously, which is, you know, better than the Great Depression, but, um, you know, it's sort of splitting hairs at a certain point, right? Um, so, I, yeah, no, I'd be curious if anyone can kind of tackle that. Glass Steagall. I mean, Glass Steagall, I, go, go ahead if you want to. Well, no, go ahead, Glass So, Glass Steagall was a law that was put in place to prevent banks and other financial institutions from getting involved in some of the more speculative investments. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like mortgage companies. And that was put in place when? Uh, that's... Was that no, that was in the Depression. That was in like, so part of the... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right, so it was, it was part of that whole like legislative... 34, package. 35. Okay. Great. And then, I would say, in the 90s, there started to be more and more lobbying on the part of the financial uh, institutions to eliminate Glass Steagall to allow them to get into those businesses. Mm -hmm. And they finally succeeded, I think it was under Clinton, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes. When they finally uh, succeeded. And at that point, all hell broke loose in terms of, you know, some of these incredibly complex derivatives. That's what I was saying about Iceland. So Iceland was essentially investing in U.S. subprime mortgages. And so, um, many of those people didn't even have a job to be able to pay those mortgages. Right. And they were just in these incredibly complex financial instruments, these bonds. And if, if you want to line up people against the wall, you know who should be lined up against the wall? Yeah. It would be the rating agencies. 
Moody's, Standard & Poor, who rated those bonds triple A, even though they were garbage, even though they were incredibly, you know, horrendous investments, unbelievably risky, but they rated them triple A because they got huge fees for doing the rating. So that's really what caused the Great Recession. And the difference between the Great Recession and the Depression, the Great Depression, is only that Ben Bernanke was head of the Federal Reserve, and he happens to be an expert on the causes of the Great Depression and the fact that we didn't inject a ton of money into the banking system. And so the downward spiral just continued. Obviously, Bernanke advocated to inject, you know, probably trillions of dollars into this banking system to keep the entire system from freezing up, which is what happened in the Great Depression. So it was really Glass-Steagall, I think, the repeal of Glass-Steagall that caused the Great Recession. I think that was part of it, but I think there were other factors. Part, you know, um, Fannie Mae, which was created in, in the 30s as well, to provide a, a safe um, national mortgage system, that was privatized in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. um, and instead of being a government agency, then uh, they really had to become investor driven. Um, and right. um, in 2005, where um, you had the collateralized mortgage obligations um, and private labeling, uh, Fannie Mae was left behind. And so Fannie Mae, instead of being a regulator, because they had to sell stock and, and appeal, yeah, because they were responsible to investors, not and so, you know, generally standard banking regulations, you know, traditionally since the 30s and even before, you know, 27 to 30 percent were sort of standard ratios for what you should pay for your mortgage. Or and the same thing, you know, we, we use the same 30 percent standard for what's an affordable rent. That's sort of you pay 30 percent of your household budget should go towards shelter. If all of a sudden you take that away and say 60% is the normal, it's, you're doomed to failure. The other thing was this, uh, not only Glass-Steagall, but the fact that we moved the banking, the mortgage system away from banks to the securities market, to Wall Street. And so you no longer, we still had the uh, regulations, the controller of the currency, the FDIC were regulating banks, but the banks essentially moved out of, or they, were, they were left behind in the mortgage business. It all went to Wall Street, it all went to the securities, and then Glass-Steagall came in right. and, and stopped the regulation of those securities. So it was you know, a, a very complicated, but you know, very predictable, and there were folks who were saying, this is gonna happen, and it did. Can you interject? Please. So we're historians, so we're really interested in change over time, and so the sort of different responses that the federal government had to a slightly, of course this is a slightly different situation that was during the Great Depression. With the Great Depression, we had like a lot of infusion of government money to, to save capitalism, so to speak, right? And so why the different responses, right? So if Obama does anything, he gets accused of right away of being a socialist, right? Sorry, can you speak a little louder? <laughs> or slower. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Should've no one ever says that. I should have, I should have, yeah. <laughs> I feel like I should have had an acting lesson to my job. I got to have classes, you can take classes. I really should, I really should, because we are, Radius performance just nerves somehow and we have to do public speaking for a living. But what I was saying is, is that, so, you know, why did the federal government, like, why, you know, this is a much more conservative time. Why, right? And part of it has to do with the fact that, as, you know, as I think Luke was talking about, the movement of people. So during the Great Depression, people were moving around, and so we just sort of mentioned the bonus marchers. Have you guys ever heard about the bonus marchers? Mm -hmm. The bonus marchers were war one vets who were promised a bonus in 1945 to get some money, right? And so, but they said, I don't need it in 1945, I need it now. So a bunch of them started in, in Washington State. They marched across the nation to camp out in Washington, D.C., a huge sort of like, you know, um, shanty town that was, was popped up over there, right? And so, there was a, and they were waiting for Congress to sort of vote on this, which in, in the end voted against it. But the sense that the people had there is that, wow, it could happen here. We could have revolution here, the rich against the poor. And you think about it, the 1930s, not that far away from 1917, 1919. And so it seemed like a possibility. You had people on the move. And so that was a threat. 
So one of the main things that um, FDR did was the um, civilian, what's it called? Civilian, conservation. Conservation, conservation Corps. Corps. What was the purpose of that? Well, you <coughs> have a bunch of young men, they could cause a lot of trouble, so let's stick them in the forest and cut wood. <laughs> right? I mean, it becomes a way to sort of keep social stability. So that's one sort of difference, I think, that I want to mention. And there's this really great speech. I don't know if you guys heard of Smedley Butler. Has anyone heard of Smedley Butler? I'm sorry, I wish I could have one of you actors read this because this is such a great speech. So anyways, so they had this sort of critique of capitalism right then in, um, in the 1930s, and I think Smedley Butler made a speech sort of like this at the bonus camper. I'm not, she was a, a marine general, right? And he had taken part in interventions in China and the Boxer Revolution, um, Honduras, Nicaragua, Mexico, Haiti, and World War I. And he became a critic, and he wrote this book in 1935 called War is a Racket. You know this? Wars a racket? No, you know? Okay, this is like a real, this is a great quote. I spent, and this is him, this is him as an old man, I spent 33 years and four months in active military service, and during that period, I spent most of my time as a high class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street, and the bankers. In short, I was a racketeer, a gangster for capitalism. I helped make Mexico, and especially Tampico, safe for American oil interests in 1914. I helped make Haiti and Cuba a decent place for the National City Bank boys to collect revenues in. I helped in the raping of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefit of Wall Street. I helped purify Nicaragua for the International Banking House of the Round Brothers in 1902-1912. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for the American sugar interests in 1916. I helped make Honduras right for American fruit companies in 1903. In China, in 1927, I helped to see that Standard Oil went on its way unmolested. Looking back on it, I could have given Al Capone a few hints. <laughs> the first thing he could do was operate his racket on three districts. I operated on three continents. Yeah. So there, nice. were, there were these critiques that were happy of capitalism at the time, and it was a much more, a slightly more, there was a more sense of radical possibility, right? And so the question is, and I, I have to disagree a little bit, I think people know that there's a problem. And I think people know that there's a problem with this. Everyone's heard about the subprime. Everyone's heard about like these all these sort of shenanigans were happening. But the question is, people don't know what to do about it. Right. Like, what do we do about it? What, what, you know? And we seem to sort of we lack the imagination or the wherewithal to know what to do with this sort of knowledge that we kind of have, but we don't really know. But there's no sort of sense of any kind of collective action whatsoever. And given that. Um, and given the ways in which our news media is now becoming even more and more, you know, consolidated, right? Uh, what do we, where do we go? What do we do? You know, where, you know, what, what can we do? We had, we saw little inklings a couple of years ago with Occupy, right? But beyond that, there's just, you know, people don't seem to really know what to do, and I think that's a problem, right? I think people know there's a problem. People are really upset. But what do we, as citizens of this country, what can we do? Yeah. But I, I think people don't know what to do. And, you That's know, what I mean. Yeah. We're, we're, but, you know, um, and you know, you talked about you know post World War One before, and the whole Keynesian philosophy, you know, and the paradox of thrift, right. you know, and the um, the world bankers at the time were debating, you know, should is austerity or spending, you know, the right strategy? Well, we're dealing with exactly the same situation now with Germany in reverse, you know, um, and you know, now Germany is the creditor country and the rest of the world are the debtors. And, you know, again, what is the solution? Is it austerity? Is it spending? And then the same issue here in the United States. And if you look at the first two years of the Obama administration and the stimulus and recovery programs which were put into place, they really had great potential. But then you had the Republicans come in and take control of the House, which shut all of that down and really prevented any further spending programs. And we've just seen this steady erosion of, of spending programs. You know, Rhode Island has lost a hundred million dollars in housing spending just in the past three years. You can't take that out of the economy um, without it having a major impact. And that's just in housing. And that, you know, you look, um, I've had a couple of uh, uh, Senate hearings with Sen Senator Whitehouse and Senator Reid. And when you look at what we're doing in terms of shutting down um, childhood immunization and shutting down Head Start and shutting down investment in entrepreneurs at the, at the universities, and you know it's just we're we're crushing the system because we're not spending. Mm -hmm. um, I have a feeling yeah. that there 
there are critiques of austerity out there, and actually our colleague at Brown, Mark Blythe, has written a whole book on austerity. Actually, if you actually Google him, Mark Blythe, austerity, he has a really fantastic little short YouTube in which he explains how it just doesn't work. It doesn't make any sense. And most people kind of, not most people, a lot of people know that, and yet, why do we keep on following these policies? And yet there's why? two you know? UMass economists who published a paper yeah. recently which showed that they fudged the data right. on right. how austerity right. is supposed to help PhD student. Yeah, supposed to help economies, but either they fudged it or they made a big mistake. Yeah. So now it turns out austerity sinks your economy. Uh, so. But there is this, you know, and enough we'll talk about climate change and the denial there. We deny the science there. We deny the science of Keynesian economics. Um, but we keep doing it over and over again. And you know, we shut down Washington today over that same debate. Right. Yeah, I know. I, I almost wish that we had someone just to, for the sake of an, an argument, because I'd love to hear the other side of it, because I honestly can't see it. You know what I mean? Like, I <laughs> Maybe someone out there. Yeah, right, yeah, no, we made that depth. It's good enough. So I can give you the other side. Oh, wow. Ah, great. Great so, soul. I, I agree that a daughter who devotes her life to making the world a better place and a bunch of uh, Tea Party members who think uh, uh, every giveaway program is uh, one step um, closer to damnation. So the, the other side of this is. Uh, if we keep paying people more to be homeless and hungry, then they're going to be homeless. And they're going to be more homeless and hungry. Uh, to, to phrase it just a little bit more uh, uh, believable, if, if, if we increase unemployment benefits, then there's less incentive to become employed. So, uh, and, and there are lots and lots of people who believe it's a real serious problem. Richard, do you want to? Yes, um, and <laughs> pardon me while I turn my eye, the light is shining in our eyes, so. Um, I designed it that way. <laughs> you know, um, there, are, there, there are moral arguments either way, and, and there are certainly, there are the moral arguments which you just put forth is, you know, we're encouraging sloth, uh, you know, we, if we give people more benefits, then they, they won't work. Um, and then there are also um, the bleeding heart liberals which say, you know, uh, there's a moral right to housing, there's a moral right to health care. And so, you know, there, there are moral persuasions on both sides. You know, I try to look at it more um, in a self interested way. You know, what is, um, what is in the best interest of everyone? And, you know, for example, um, Eric and I did this study. Uh, we, we funded it, Eric um, did the, um, the numbers, where we took 50 homeless men, um, and we put them, well, uh, 50 chronically <coughs> homeless men, and we gave them an apartment and supportive services. That saved, on an average basis, the taxpayer $10,000 for each one of those men, because they were no longer using the prison system, the hospital system, the substance abuse system. And so, you know, 50 men saved $500,000 to the taxpayer, in addition to incredibly better outcomes for those 50 individuals and for society as a whole, because we didn't have those men drifting on the streets. So here's a very documented case of what's good for everybody, but it's denied because of the moral argument that well, gee, we're just encouraging sloth. There's one guy, homeless guy downtown, that uh, every couple of weeks he gets hungry, he can't find, he just drops down on the ground and starts moaning, and uh, they have to send an ambulance to pick him up, which costs thousands of dollars every time he does this. You know, he's perfectly right, he just does this act so that he gets fed, because they'll take him to the hospital, feed him, they'll check him out, and give him do all this other stuff. Thousands of dollars down the drain every time this guy does this. But I think, the, Eric, you can correct me on, on this um, Housing First study. You know, we, these men still use the system, <coughs> but on average, the night, the, the, the emergency calls and the nights in high cost went from 140 to about 140 per individual. Mm -hmm. It went from to 40. Oh, to 40. 40. Oh, to 40. Oh, to 40. Oh, to 40. Oh, so there, one, maybe a hypothesis, I don't know, um, that 
part of what at least might be behind some of the austerity, the enthusiasm for austerity is the fear of inflation, right? <clears throat> so if you're uh, uh, talking about the 1% or the 0.001%, and the people who are doing really well in this economy, um, of which there are, right? People who are doing really well. <clears throat> um, if, uh, uh, if you promote enough stimulus, if you have enough um, social programs that cost money, at some point the way to pay for it is to just print more money, right? And that causes inflation, and that of course devalues investments. So for people at the very top of the economy, they, <clears throat> there might actually be a kind of rational self-interest at play here as well. It's not just kind of craziness it's or immorality. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> but again, if we, could save, if we could right? save money, that it runs counter to that argument because we're actually reducing uh, the burden of the tax buyer, you know, and therefore that would free up that money for investment. You're thinking about the whole society. <laughs> 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 I'm talking about the, the very few people who, who have no interest in the overall health of society. Why can't we expand that program then? Why? Yes. Because we can't get the money to do so. Because uh, the, the, the challenge becomes, how do you recapture those dollars from the healthcare system from the penal system, uh, uh, from the substance abuse system, from the met the human service system. Because they're not paying you to. Right. Uh, so it's how it's totally down, it's down totally the same sort of externalities as as you put it. You can't measure them as well as you can the direct dollars that are spent. It's all about the state legislators <coughs> worrying about this fiscal year. <laughs> They're not going to invest money because they have to balance their books for the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So anytime you talk to them about this will save money in the long run, they look at you like you have two heads. Right. So that's, that's why our state economy is in such bad shape because they can't think long term. They're never going to do anything to make it better. Right. They're always doing stopgap measures you know, year to year. Right, and they also have to worry about getting elected too, right? It's, you know, they have to look at, they can't do something necessarily long term because they have to run for uh, some kind of election later on. Right. I mean, but the public opinion polling we've done show that people think it's a good idea to put homeless people into homes. They think that's a good use of money. Mm -hmm. um, another question? Yeah, right yeah so I have a couple of questions, but um, uh, this is fascinating. I'm wondering if we can kind of switch to a little bit to uh, supply and demand. Um, did, did the people in the 1930s who were growing wheat uh, in the, uh, it, turning over uh, grasses uh, to grow wheat, did they not understand the whole supply and demand process? Um, and, I, and the reason I ask that is that in many cases, even as the prices went down, they decided they would just plow under more land <laughs> uh, and, and try and grow more of that, which then just drives the price down further. So I'm not I don't understand where the whole idea of supply and demand, the economics and the history of all of that, where that actually started influencing um, our extractive uh, approach to the economy. And, and in, supply, in, in addition, I'd like to talk a little bit about immigration and the supply and demand of people in California. You know, there are, instances of collectivization of those efforts. As, as long as you have an individual making that supply and demand decision by himself, then they act in their own self-interest, which is to produce more. Um, so you really have to go to this collective approach. And you, you have some, you know, the government tried to do that with some systems, and then you have other collectives like um, Ocean Spray Cranberry or Fisherman's Collaboratives today. Sure. Harking back to Grapes of Wrath, then you had the whole communist theory, you know, and they were reds. You know, as soon as you start to act, act collectively and think of the common good, you were communist and therefore evil. I see. Mm -hmm. So it was discouraged to. Absolutely, to but then collectively. Yeah. Okay, and how about supply and demand related to immigration, either in today's or back in the 30s and everyone moving to California because they didn't have any place to go? There's obviously a, a labor market as well, right? So the more people you have uh, available to work, unless, I mean, this again gets back to a point that we've been making a lot, which is that, you know, these are systemic challenges and so they require systemic solutions or system-wide solutions. So absent government regulation, right, if you can pay people whatever wages sure. they're willing to take, if you have more people pouring into an area because they're destitute, then wages will, wages will fall. 
<clears throat> to a point where it's unsustainable. Uh, so, what, of course, the only and and um, you know this is th that basic point about you know um, markets work uh, on collective levels, right? They don't <clears throat> individuals don't unless they're individuals who happen to be in very particular situations, like they're <clears throat> individuals on the board of directors of a corporation or individuals in the government or something like that. Individuals have very, they can make decisions for themselves, but they can't influence whole markets for the most part, unless they come together to form collectives or unions or <clears throat> things like that. Uh, so individuals don't have a choice but to just take whatever wages are offered them. So what you need is you need uh, government intervention, and, and, and uh, there was a lot of reluctance to really Certainly was then, but we know more now. <laughs> you would think, right? <laughs> I mean, when was that? I mean, but try raising the minimum wage. <laughs> no, I listen, I, I pay attention as well, but I'm thinking about immigration of people moving from Syria, you were saying, into, into Europe, or it's still happening today. Well, and there's huge xenophobia in Europe, uh, more and more xenophobia against uh, Islam, against people from Africa. <clears throat> and it's not a coincidence that it's precisely at the time when you have higher rates of immigration from these parts of the world. Yeah. Part of it also is desperation versus hope. Sure, of course. You know, um, you will, um, if you're starving, or if, if your children are starving, um, I, you will tend to you know, overlook the facts and move toward it. Also, there is, you know, I can, yes, um, I'm going to prevail. There may be nine people out of work out of 10, but I'm going to be the one in 10 who's going to be employed. Uh, because I'm going to work harder and I'm going to work stronger. <clears throat> and, you know, we saw this um, in the subprime lending as well. Um, Rhode Island has some of the highest rent costs in the country to be, be what people earn. And so they're paying very high cost for rent, $1,000, $1,100 a month. Someone comes along and says, you can buy a house for $560 a month. <laughs> Um, and, you know, you're going, wow, this is found money. I'm not going to look this gift horse in the mouth because I've got this bank giving me $200,000 and saying I only have to pay it back at the rate of $560 a month. So, yes, you might know it doesn't add up, but you're going to save yourself 500 bucks a month, which you can spend on, you know, putting food in your kids. You can always refinance or sell because the market's always going to continue to go up. That was the assumption. Right. The and housing so, market is never going to collapse. So. so who had the moral evil? Was it the family which took the money, you know, and knowing realistically they couldn't pay it back, or the banker which gave them the money uh, and, you know, expected to refinance it over and over again? So, uh, again, uh, as our agency has tried to work through um, mediating between banks um, and homeowners, we really have taken the judgment out of it. It's like, okay, let's try to get to mutual self-interest today. You know, whose interest is it to keep this family in their home or that bank? If you're going to have this huge loss, let's try to work something, uh, let's work something out. So, like, uh, going back to the story of immigration and labor and labor supply and what have you. So, if you had negotiated over us that I was. We were reminded just the other night that there's this whole system of having, was it orange? Yeah. You know, sort of the you know little advertisements come, come, come. <laughs> it was systematically done such that there would be an oversupply of labor so that you could abuse it very easily, right? Mm -hmm. This is precisely what's happening still with like you know uh, Latino immigrants, or, uh, undocumented in other words, right? It's a whole sort of same sort of system. I mean, we can get to a larger, longer story about NAFTA, what that's done, and why people are coming over here. But also the system is set up such that it keeps people vulnerable and scared. And vulnerable and scared people are cheaper flavors, right? And it's, it's the same sort of hell that's happening. It's really ugly that's happening today that we have to be very mindful of. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to follow up on all those points, but take it in just a slightly, uh, add one other dimension, which is, I mean, there seems to be, um, I mean, you've laid out clearly what the downside of applying market forces um, to the plight of the Joes is. I mean, uh, their house got knocked down, uh, they were uprooted from their community, they left behind the cemeteries of their ancestors, and they got to California and were scared, vulnerable, and abused. Um, but mobility 
was, uh, for better or for worse, that's when I'll see the worse, um, a market response to the Dust Bowl. It got people off the land, uh, land which temporarily couldn't support the people, and allowed then the Soil Conservation Service to come in and uh, eventually when the rains came back, bring that land back into productivity. Um, and it seems to me so that, you know, market forces can supply some good. So today when we look at what's the appropriate balance for government between keeping people in their communities and uh, supported, um, providing them with money to rebuild after <coughs> a hurricane and allowing enough mobility to get the, the positive from market responses. And how does the government today balance that, taking into account both the plight of the Joads and what we did successfully do to recover from the Dust Bowl? Market forces work fine if you have equal power on both sides and equal access to information. Um, because then people can make rational decisions, but it's, you never have that perfect match on both sides of the equation. And to gain a competitive advantage, people try to get more access to information than the person on the other side. And you, you see that with the, it's insider trading, whether it's you know, someone at the, at the grocery store with regard to <coughs> putting a thumb on the scale. You know, it's, it's always, um, or if you have immigration, access to understanding, language barriers, being able to understand the documents. And really what government's role should be is to try to make the market, or at least the United States system should be, to make sure the market decisions are fair, and that there's equal bargaining points equal bargaining power on both sides and equal access to information. That kind of free market system is, net, is, is an ideal, but you try to, need to try to make it as good as possible. And the reason why that's persistent is because it cuts out a profit margin, right? So the logic of capitalism is unending profits, profits for profit's sake, continual profits, right? And so that's why the people who are, you know, will, will not want to, they want to squash labor. They don't, they, you know, it's ideal if they think, oh yeah, this is really great, let's all, you know, agree what the wages will be and everything will be groovy like that, but that's not the logic of capitalism. It doesn't work that way, actually. And the other thing is the, is the fact of efficiency. So we think that, most of us think to be efficient is the best thing, right? We want to all be efficient with our time. And so if we apply this to agriculture, right, to make somebody to be an efficient sort of worker, right, to produce more with one person, that makes sense, right, to do that. But then, let's say a place like India, what happens to all the other people? You don't need them anymore on their land. One person can do with their tractor and their, you know, their gen gen genetically modified seeds or what have you. Then what happens? What happens? You know what's happening in India right now? Like 200,000 farmers have committed suicide in the last 10 years over this. It's because they're being pushed off the land. So therefore you have other people saying, well, you know, maybe efficiency isn't the best thing necessarily, especially in terms of our culture. Let people grow food, right? It's not efficient at all in terms of like producing more and more profit, but it might be a way to keep people from killing themselves or from dying. We have it, with this logic, we have an excess of people in the world, right? I'm always struck when I fly across the country how empty this country is, that you've got just so much open space, but nothing to do with that open space. Our country is, you know, weighted down on the two I coasts. a lot of farmland. I see a lot of, like, the, there's not a little, you know, it's like, you know, it's corporate agriculture. What's right. it called? Agribusiness, Agri you know? I mean, that's who owns it. So what happens to, it used to be when people got pushed off the land in the early modern period, they went to factories, you know? They went to settler colonies or what have you. Well, those opportunities aren't necessarily there anymore, right? I just want to say too, you know, the market's not working with regard to housing. That's pretty clear. If half of your population can't afford the rent. so. What are those people supposed to do? Let's say you're working a minimum wage job, you're making 16000 a year, and the typical apartment's going to cost your entire salary. So there's, there's a breakdown there. There's, 
the failure of the market to do what it's supposed to do, which is the housing market, which is to provide housing to people that they can afford. So at that point, government has to step in. It's really the only solution. Or you're going to have people on the street, a large and growing number of people on the street. Yeah, uh, I really don't, I, I mean, someone tell me <laughs> how that's going to work. <clears throat> or a couple hundred thousand uh, households in Rhode Island. I'd say, let's say 180,000 households out of 400,000 can't afford to rent an apartment. You know, you can talk about the efficiency of the market. I mean, it's broken. It's not working. It's a complete failure at what it's supposed to do. And then you read that the highest paid person in the state of Rhode Island is the basketball coach of the URI, $600,000 a year. That upsets me more than someone on welfare or an ambulance taking somebody off the street. I I almost, my head almost blew up. <laughs> so I don't know whether it's a failure of the market or a failure of uh, the government. In, in a market system, every time there's a transaction, two people are better off. The seller is better off because he wanted to sell, and the buyer is better off because he wanted to buy. And so those two people are better off. So, <clears throat> so who should pay if somebody's homeless? The, the market isn't working uh, if, if the problem that we collectively are trying to solve is homelessness, but we collectively aren't trying to solve the homelessness problem. No, and, and it isn't, it isn't easy. The, uh, there's been a huge benefit to uh, the market system. Uh, the market system beat communism by a lot. You know, this collective ownership of all of the resources didn't work either. What worked is people owning those resources and getting the benefit of them. And so the redistribution of those is still an enormous problem, but I don't think it's a problem of the market. It's a problem of government. It's a problem of who's going to pay for it. And a whole bunch of stingy people thinking that nobody should pay. Nobody should have to pay for it because the homeless, if they didn't want to be homeless, they'd buy a house. <laughs> the, um, you know, a lot of what's wrong with the housing system is <coughs> government regulation. Uh, we could solve the homeless. We, if we, could, we could build affordable homes in Rhode Island if local cities and towns would let us. One of the things that has led to uh, the demise of our cities all across the country. Um, and one of the reasons that our housing costs here are so high are is the regulatory scheme that prevents us from building homes. And therefore, developers move to the least regulated environment. They keep moving further and further out where they can build uh, more affordable at higher densities. Here in Rhode Island, uh, it is virtually impossible to build a home for less than three hundred and fifty thousand mm -hmm. uh, dollars, and that's you know. So when you start with that, it just you, you can't solve the problem. What are the regulations? Yeah. I mean, what what are, what are the regulations trying to accomplish, but in fact uh, having this other effect that um, under the guise of well, first of all, a lot of them are exclusionary, you know, and a lot of them is driven. Lot driven sizes, you know, um, Fear of children in the school. There's a, virtually every town, every city and town in the state does not want more kids in their schools because of their fear of taxes going up. Therefore, more housing means more kids means higher taxes. That is the basic equation that drives the entire land use regulatory structure in Rhode Island and many other places. Um, you go to a local planning board meeting, you'll hear endless arguments over whether this home will have 1.6 kids or 1.3 kids. Um, it, it, is, it sounds absurd, but that's what you have. And again, the, the reality is towns which grow um, have lower taxes than towns which are stagnant. Rhode Island has higher taxes because we're stagnant, because we don't allow growth. Smithfield is supposed to have uh, low income housing, when you build a house, it's supposed to be a certain percentage of the zone. So okay. when you zone, say, Well, I, I'm going to zone this for high income houses, it's supposed to zone it for low income. 
and yet they've been dodging that for years. I don't know how they do it. They managed to not build any public housing for the past 15 years. Probably build a single unit. But they're supposed to. Every year you're supposed to have, well, you build 500 houses here, you're supposed to build, I don't know, 100 there maybe. I don't know what the percentages are. I know there's some lore on this. But somehow they managed to dodge this for the past 10, 15 years. I don't know how they do it. They do it. They're not the only ones. Um, I, I like your response to this notion of the perfection of the market system where you have a buyer on one side and a, and a seller on the other. Um, the Joads who have been pushed off their land by forces that are so much larger than they are are not any part of that equation. And there are so many people in our society today who are just like the Joes. They, they are not buyers or sellers. They are victims. And another piece of what goes on here, and you mentioned it when you were talking about you know, moving it to Syria, and you know, in, in all these cases where there are basic uh, struggles for scarce resources, the thing that makes it possible for people to do terrible things to each other is this demonization of the other. Mm -hmm. And when you devalue someone and you call them an Oki or you call them uh, a Shia, <coughs> or a Shia, depending on which side you're on, it makes it possible, to, or, or you call them a deadbeat, you call them a loafer, you call them uh, you know, someone who's sponging off the rest of us. When you do that and you demonize that other, then it, it makes it possible for you to um, do horrible things to them. Let me go back to the school issue. It's not just the taxes. It's we don't want those kids in our schools. They'll bring down our test scores. They'll contaminate our kids. They're going to bring ideas, and we don't want them doing to do that. And I think that's a big part of how school systems. It's just racism. That's what it is. Or classism. But I think that, you know, it's so much a part of our society that people are responsible for their own fate. And I agree, you know, we were talking earlier, yes, people do understand their problems at the top of the system. But they still are thinking, and this includes homeless people themselves, they have this shame because they're homeless. They just assume somehow it was their fault. Right? Even though if you go back in every homeless history, every person, it was out of their control every time. So somehow we have to get past that idea that everyone is responsible for their own position in society. Uh, because, you know, that's the ultimate problem, I think. That's really the problem that we face. If we could get past that, I think we could solve the problem. Yeah. I, had a, I had a question. Um, we still kind of base our hope on increasing economic growth, increasing GDP. Um, and how are we doing that? Well, we've moved out of the U.S. We're now into all the other countries, and it's still based on extraction. Right? We're just extracting it from somewhere else and making our products and selling them here. How do we switch this? I mean, how do, what do we go to? What do we, sure there's regulation, right? But the more and more regulation, the more and more we get closer to socialism or communism, and that's scary. Where, where, do we, where do we turn? What do we do? <laughs> the, the solution would be really hard, right? To sort of give you right now. It'd be hard to sort of, it'd be, hey, that'd be great if we thought of a solution we could all enact it. That would be fantastic. But think about GDP. I don't know if you've talked about this in your classes. It's like, why do we use this measure? What does this measure do, you know? And so that would be a, a first sort of line of, you know, kind of inquiry overall, right? I would have to say that part of it also has to do with the way that it's being sort of talked about naturalized in our economic sort of like um, discourse, right? Or like in Bloomberg News or, you know, whatever. It's just kind of there in our news and in our discourse. And also the way econ is being taught at universities. Not UMass, but, you know, a lot of universities <laughs> where econ is being taught that also will influence the ways in which people think about or are, are able to think through economic ideas. There's one, I, I totally agree with that. I'll have one more thing, which is that um, getting back to what 
when we started, what I, what I started talking about, which is <clears throat> the kind of um, asymmetry or disconnect or between, um, on the one hand, economic theory, on the other hand, ecological theory. <clears throat> uh, economic theory, um, prosperity is based on growth, right? At, at least in, in kind of capitalism. Right? So <clears throat> the way that you maintain a prosperous society is by uh, is on the margin, right? By having more uh, the next year than you had the year before, right? And that's what drives um, that's what drives all of our prosperity. <clears throat> um, the problem is that that's uh, in that works for a while, but it's in the really long term, it's ecologically unsustainable. Ecological theory is based on this has more cyclical. If you look at ecological mo models, they tend to have very cyclical kinds of um, um, mathematics to them. There tends to be, you know, uh, the kind of language that people use is, is about more things like balance, right? <clears throat> the problem is that they're sort of fundamentally, you know, the math kind of doesn't um, uh, doesn't add. They're kind of incompatible with one another, right? Um, so you do. <clears throat> And I, I certainly don't have a solution to give you. <laughs> it's the opposite. It's the really pessimistic kind. Of um, but you, at some point, you run into a wall, and it's not clear what um, you know. And it's not clear how far away we are from it. But we might be getting pretty close. <clears throat> and it's not. Um, I don't think. I don't think anyone has a solution, right? Otherwise, we. Well, in capitalism, it seems either expands and grows or declines. There's no stability to it. It goes in one direction or the other. <clears throat> so that's the problem with the model long term. I agree. Certainly, it's not sustainable ecologically. So at some point, it's going to blow up in our face. You would think. I I, I tend to disagree uh, because when you think about the individual spirit, uh, I mean we we talk about our own GDP uh, and even the Joes. You know, they wanted to increase their GDP, you know, their own earnings. They wanted to do better. They wanted to do better for themselves, for their children. Uh, you know, they wanted to take it up. You know, some of them wanted to take it up from survival, but Al wanted much more. He wanted, you know, a car, and you know, um, and so when you take the sum total of all of us trying to do better, all trying to increase our own individual GDP. That's what translates into the overall country looking to grow its GDP. Right, that's, that's Adam Smith, which makes a lot of sense, right? The invisible hand, each of us acting in our own economic interests is going to magically work. But the other part that gets forgotten, and Adam Smith is the theory of moral sentiment, in which he says, but you have to have empathy. You have to care about other people. Yeah. That was essential to what he was saying, but that gets forgotten, usually. You know? mm -hmm. so. Do we have time for maybe one or two more? Becky, were you going to say something? I, I was, I, maybe, maybe not. Uh, <laughs> I, I might just ramble around for a bit. Uh, you know, I, I walked away from, from this play uh, feeling stirred to action, but not, not knowing in which direction to point my energies, you know? And I think that's a lot of uh, what you were talking about. It's like, where are we? Um, and it, it, just listening to all of you, it seems like, one of, one of the ways that maybe we can focus ourselves, and correct me if, our, if I'm wrong, one of, one of the causes that we can take up is, is kind of a, um, taking on these, these regulatory measures for housing. And may, do you think that that's maybe one way that if collectively we can point our energies to try and, and steer past the problem of homeless, homelessness and, and, and start to make an impact? Like what would be the simplest way to collectively move something? Moving forward, there is no simple way, yeah. and, and you know one of the one of the great things about Rhode Island is that we have so many folks working in so many at so many different levels. You know, with the Coalition for the Homeless is made up of people with passion working at various niches. We have community development corporations working in in different neighborhoods. You know, there are folks committed to housing for victims of domestic violence. There are people who are passionately committed to people who have substance abuse people who have mental health issues. Uh, there are, um, there's a group that works with um, drug addicted um, pregnant moms. Um, we have lots, we, our organization works with 100, over 100 different nonprofits which have the passion of their members, their executive directors, their board members, and they're making a difference. Um, and so there's, there are lots of, 
of different ways. And then there were coalitions. There's a coalition for the homeless. There's the housing network, again, which is a coalition of, of these groups who are trying to change things. And so, you know, there were lots and lots of ways to make a difference. Um, and, uh, uh, and I think, you know, the long-term answer is, you know, we have been struggling with the issue of homelessness, you know, before the Great Depression. Um, I did my thesis in housing abandonment uh, 40 years ago. Um, and I'm still, you know, fighting the battle every day. You know, one of these days, I'm going to retire. <laughs> but there will be others who will keep fighting the same battle. And so hopefully young folks like you will, will keep pushing the agenda forward. In terms of the coalition, it's, uh, the website is rihomeless.org, and we can always use the help. So we have a plan to end homelessness in Rhode Island. It's called Opening Doors Rhode Island. It's very specific. It shows how resources are committed from various sources and the actual decline in the number of homeless people that will result if those resources are committed. Unfortunately, we don't have the resources. We don't have the money from the state or the federal government at this point for some of the reasons that Richard was discussing. Um, all right, so real quick. Um, I so just, I, not necessarily a question, but I, one, I bought my house through Rhode Island Housing 13 years ago, and I'm really uh, pleased with that program. Two, I saw the play twice and was extremely moved uh, both times. And there were two particular lines that really stuck with me. And one is, um, when uh, it was said, why can't we, um, why is it that when someone makes a living, they can't do it without taking it away from someone else? And the other uh, is sort of related about how when Tom Jones starts to realize that what they're trying to do is break their spirits. And so I think, you know, now the way I think about, you know, the homelessness and, and the market and so we're, you end up with people who are just, their spirits are broken, they're really beat down, and they feel like this problem is really insurmountable. And those who have sort of the power, you know, the, the pivotal moment of the repeal of Glass-Steagall seems like this, it was this sort of purposeful act of, you know, getting by all these loopholes, and, and that it was done on purpose. And so I think people uh, who are beat down kind of feel like there's just no way to sort of turn this around and, and um, so I, I, maybe I don't know what my point is, but I think um, you know it seems like it's up to those of us who are who are not yet you know broken uh, that you know we sort of collectively have to kind of you know keep on you know steady on for whatever it is that you know might eventually turn it around. That's great. That's great. Yes. You know, it's it's, it's uh, very very tempting to walk out of here feeling helpless and hopeless. This has not been a particularly happy, uh, happy discussion here, and it's supposed to be. But I want to take us back to the play and, and, and the, 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 the view of the people in the play. They were totally on their own. They felt like they were totally on their own, and they were totally, if they, hell, they would have been better off if they had been totally on their own, but every time they turned around, somebody was there to beat the shit out of them. <laughs> you know, either, either officially or unofficially. And that's where I've been sort of trying to compare then versus now. And is there a lot of work to um, be done still? Oh, yeah. But are there people that are doing it? Oh, yeah. Great. I mean, uh, you know, these are really serious and trenchant issues and ideas, and um, you know, sort of like you're saying, it's certainly important to talk about them and discuss them uh, and flesh them out, and not kind of just you know think about them, but to talk to someone else. Uh, but it's also important to act on them. Um, uh, and I want to thank the panel, and let's all give them a nice round of applause. Uh, and on a slightly less serious note, um, I'm glad no one brought up Breaking Bad, because I didn't see the episode last night. <laughs> 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 I 
I'm glad you decided to bring that up and tie it into the conversation. Um, <laughs> I haven't seen. Um, uh, but um, again, uh, the date for that uh, benefit show is uh, October 11th. It's a Friday. Uh, if you want to see the show again, please come. It goes to a good cause. Uh, and um, you know, thank you so much for coming to this discussion. You know, this is why we do theater. You know, this is why we do plays like The Grapes of Wrath that have these kind of issues to generate a conversation. Um, so thanks for being a part of it. Thank you very much. We'll see you.